I wonder if you could recapitulate a little bit of your thoughts on on life as information, which which I believe you touched upon in, in a previous book. Um, but uh, what what is life uh, to answer uh, the uh, if you can answer Schrodinger's question left unanswered in his book? Uh, life does seem pretty remarkable to a physicist. Uh, I think I said earlier, it's like magic. Um, what uh, life needs uh, what uh, genetic information needs. It needs some stability if it's to be handed on from one generation to the next. shouldn't be thermally disrupted. Mm. So it needs to be have the property, st stable property of a crystal. It needs to lock in um, its structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but it needs... Uh, crystals uh, don't contain any information. They're just periodic structures. Um, and so what you need to encode information is to have uh, to break the symmetry, as we were talking about earlier, and you have um, ir irregularities of some sort. Mm -hmm. and, he, and so the idea of an aperiodic uh, crystal is exactly, it's, it's an information-rich, stable molecule. It's just what DNA is. And because of the four-letter alphabet of DNA, uh, you can encode a staggering amount of information. Uh, in, a, in a strand of DNA, but it is, it is relatively stable. It's not disrupted by thermal uh, fluctuations uh, at room temperature. So that, that was uh, uh, pretty mm. good. But I don't think he answered the question. I think he hoped that somehow quantum mechanics would come to the rescue. Um, after all, quantum mechanics explains all other matter, but it sort of curiously can't explain living matter. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, rather more adventurously, and I take this as the jumping off point for my own recent interests, he said mm -hmm. that we must be prepared to find a new kind of physical law prevailing in it, by it he meant living systems. Mm -hmm. uh, not just a new physical law, not just, uh, you know, alongside Maxwell's equations and so forth, we, we've got, you know, Schrodinger's life equation, a new kind of physical law. So actually, directly answer your question, what is life? I would say, it's a sort of catchphrase, but that a lot of people use, that life is chemistry plus information. Mm. The essential thing about life is not any mishmash of bits. Uh, it's actually information which is uh, organized and which can bring about uh, the or organization of, of matter. In other words, it mm. serves a management role. Well, if you measure information in bits, as Shannon taught us uh, many decades ago, it doesn't somehow capture uh, the contextual nature of biological information. Uh, mm. So, uh, it, for example, if we've been talking about DNA, um, Take a gene. Uh, what is a gene? Well, it's um, uh, a set of instructions for a ribosome to make a protein, for example. Uh, but you can't tell by looking at a particular sequence of DNA whether it's instructional information or just junk. Mm. You just shuffle the bits. You <laughs> couldn't tell. It's only in the context of the system as a whole that you can tell that that information is instructional, uh, that it is functional the scales, you can't decompose it in the same way that we like to in physics. It's a yes. systemic property. So we need information which is, um, uh, which is potent only in the context of the system as a whole. And there has to be a molecular milieu that can interpret those instructions and act on it. So we're into this sort of dodgy area like, you know, semantic information and meaning and so on that, that the... Uh, Instructions in DNA have to mean something to the organism, and, <laughs> and philosophers jump on you to say, well, you can't use terms like meaning, and so you sort of slide around with the terminology. But there's no getting away from it that we're dealing uh, in living systems with not just Shannon bits, but with uh, something that goes beyond that, that we have not yet properly captured, I don't think. Yeah. And of course, that does evoke uh, concepts of creation and the ultimate teleological entity uh, and all uh, knowing omnipresent, uh, omniscient, omnipotent creator. And I do want to pivot there. Well, I'm not a conventionally religious person. Uh, that's number one. And number two is that as a scientist, I don't have to... Uh, uh, say, well, this is the way it is, and uh, I'm not going to change my mind. And so I'm interested in the issues and the concepts mm -hmm. um, that you can't work in areas like cosmology, where you ask questions like what happened before the Big Bang, uh, what is the nature of time, and then you go to quantum physics, what's the nature of reality, and uh, then you go to life, what is life, and then what is consciousness, you know, all those things which I love to think about. You can't think about those without coming up against those same age-old questions that for centuries were part of religion. You can arrive at a conclusion, well, there's something going on, or as I prefer to say, there is a, uh, a rational scheme of things uh, that science is uh, busy uh, unraveling, that, uh, that the universe is uh, 
um, is not just uh, hodgepodge of odds and ends. It is uh, a coherent uh, scheme that we can come to understand, and I think that's deeply significant. So you, you, through your science, you can arrive at a position, and if that happens to concur with some particular religious point of view, well, then that's uh, of some interest. But what you absolutely don't do is decide in advance what you want to believe. I think there's a God that did this and that, and shoehorn the scientific facts to fit. And I'm afraid there's far too many people in that latter category. They've already made up their minds that they believe in a particular type of God. And uh, uh, the worst example is, of course, um, the so-called God of the gaps. So if, uh, if somebody's convinced uh, that there is a God and God uh, created life, um, and they'll turn around and they'll say, well, you scientists can't explain the origin of life, so therefore we need God. I mean, that's, that's an appalling line of reasoning. You know, I like to talk to theologians, some of them are very smart. You see, some, some if you think back like 500 years, the greatest intellectuals were actually, you know, theologians and mathematicians. Uh, and these people uh, de de dealt with these really tough topics, like if there is a God, is God within time or outside of time? And can something come from nothing? And, you know, why does mathematics work? And, how, you know, they've thought very carefully about those things. Um, and I have found, uh, found that, uh, you know, entertaining and sometimes productive to revisit some of those mm. old arguments. And we're all engaged in trying to explain the universe. And then religious people say, well, it all goes down to God. And then you say, well, how do you explain God? Well, God doesn't need an explanation. Well, that's no good. But then they turn it around and say, well, what do you think? And I think, well, the laws of physics seem to do a nice job. Well, where do they come from? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the origin of those? And I say, oh, well, most scientists don't like asking that question. They, they just sort of accept it as given. And they say, well, point made. You know, we, we both have a what I sometimes call a levitating super turtle that holds the Tower of Turtles up. I was taught, Paul, by uh, by many eminent uh, scientists in my career that you should never ask why as a scientist. <laughs> you should only ask what, how, when, um, you know, et cetera. But, uh, but you asked this question. I want to ask it back to you. What do you mean by why? Is that a legitimate uh, question to, for legitimate physicists such as yourself to even countenance ask it? Oh, well, of course, you, you can ask what you like. And I, and I uh, strongly encourage uh, that scientists should ask the why question, even if we know that in coming up with explanations, we're, we're really dealing with the how. Because uh, it, why, why is, of course, a rather ill-defined term. Uh, but it very often carries the connotation of, uh, of purpose. You know, why, why did you do that? And if we're caught out doing something we shouldn't, then we come up with excuses. Right, or why can't I do that? And the parent always has to say, because, because I said so. We have these arcane procedures of you know, building weird machines and doing peculiar stuff to matter that maybe has never been done before, and, and writing funny symbols on blackboards and bits of paper, and sort of figuring out how the world works. And it's been just spectacularly successful. We've had, what, three and a half centuries of really doing much more than just describing the world. That's not what theoretical physics does. It, just, it doesn't just give an account of the world. It explains the world. It leads mm. to an understanding. You see the point of, about asking the why questions. It leads you to that aha moment that, ah, I've got it now. I see how it's put together. And we would like to believe, I'm sure all of us are sort of driven by this passion to explain the world, um, that there are reasons for why things are as they are, that there will be you know, three generations of particles and all of these other things. That uh, if we work a bit harder, there will be that aha moment, now it all makes sense. Uh, but of course, it's only an act of faith. It may be that the universe doesn't actually make sense or it doesn't make sense to a human being. After all, what we call common sense and what we arrive at as understanding is something that has been selected by uh, uh, evolution that uh, we've evolved uh, through natural selection to su survive in the proverbial jungle. And yet we're equipped with this cognitive ability uh, to not just observe the world, but to uh, understand it at this deeper level of reality. I consider that pretty stupendous. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it may be we just had a dream run, uh, that we've had a few centuries where we've been really good at this, and we're going to soon hit a brick wall and the whole enterprise will grind to a halt. I really hope that isn't the case. I really do think we can go further and that there is some, some underlying order that we're not, not quite getting, that, that we're missing at this stage. And that's for the next generation. We, we need help to mm -hmm. understand what's going on.